coming. Uh, to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners of this land on which Draw Space stands and pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. This land has never ceded. So um, we're sitting, I'm sitting here with Ray Fox, who's an artist in the Recomposed Drawing with Threads exhibition, also Adam Murray another artist and we're going to have a chat about their textiles practice while we stitch. Uh, Monica Svitolovic is also here but she's not on screen, she's also stitching. So I just wanted to mention that and there's also two other people here because we're, we're having um, a conversation around the collaborative textiles piece. Uh, we'll start with Ray because this is Ray's work and the title of this show is Recompose to capture, we were, uh, we were looking for a word that captured the fact that all the artists in this textile show have used, previously used textiles and repurposed to capture, to transform them into something, something different. Um, and there's always something that's within the textiles that seems to still come to the fore um, from their previous use as well as the re-presentation. So, Ray, can you tell us about the textiles that you use in your works, what are the materials and characteristics that um, you to use them for, and what are you trying to have them express? Well, um, when I was younger, I wanted to make my own clothes, which wasn't the best idea, because um, I'm not very good at um, following sewing patterns. So I made a collection of fabrics that I cut up into shapes and didn't actually use. I had a collection of fabrics from about 10 years ago, I think. Mm. And um, But I've also collected secondhand, like, other people's stashes of fabric and um, just saved old clothes and old items. Like, for example, the border of this little quilt is an old um, pillowcase of mine from my child. Um, which got damaged and I've just cut it up because I thought it would be a nice way of reusing because this quilt um, is meant to be, I guess, a child's quilt. Um, so I guess my practice looks at child clothes, gender and language and um, so I guess some of the things I wanted to um, express uh, so I've also printed onto some of the fabric um, some of the words that are more gender inclusive because I started using fabric when um, I was doing my masters I printed onto some pieces of fabric which I quilted together to make um, soft alphabet cubes but rather than like using the alphabet like I did use you know A, B, C all the letters of the alphabet but instead of using um, like apple, I used things like um, uh, like lesbian and you know all those kind of words that relate to the LGBTQ words and just like more inclusive ways of gender because I wanted to use them as like a way of teaching children about gender and sexuality in a more child sort of age appropriate way. And then um, that branched out into making larger pieces, as you can see in the exhibition, and then into making quilts, because quilts are a protective mm -hmm. layer for children as well. I think that answers the question. Yes, it does. There's, there's something in the quality of your work that's a lot about, like you say, childhood. Familiarity, I like this reminds me of that. That's great. My sister, my younger sister. And so when I see your work, that kind of there's something familiar mm -hmm. and comfortable in, in your shapes and you're, you're using that language to talk about something which if you were confused about your gender or sexuality, mm -hmm. you could feel quite you could choose to be quite oppressed and angry. Mm -hmm. And but the way that you're speaking about it is so much you just bring in so much play and fun. Yeah, well, I think gender is a very important part of it. Like this quote, I like making the quotes as a collaborative project because you can talk about that stuff. Mm. And like for my very first quote, 
workshop, um, one person who came on from the street who also worked on it, they bought their child. And I thought that made it really special because the child didn't do any sewing, but like they drew some, I think, fabric markers onto the pieces. And I included that in the book. Mm. And that felt really special. Mm. And and this is a debate I have in my own process mm. about the line between craft and art. And I feel like it's come up quite a bit in looking at some of your, your works and um, I'm sure Abby has something to say <laughs> to and Monica. Um, do you think there's a line there? Oh, I and, mean... And why, you know, you're making art that's on, on that border. Well, I mean, I guess there can be a line there. I mean, that could be for anything. Like, like my practice, I do use fabric, but I also still do printmaking. Like besides printing on the fabric, I also print on paper, like more, I guess, traditional printmaking. Um, but I do two types of traditional printmaking. Like I do, um, um, I do mono prints, and that's what I include with this practice because I need children's clothes as the matrix. Um, and then my other more traditional printmaking, which I do just as sort of more as a hobby for me, so that's what I would call maybe more of craft, although I guess is what I mean. I guess it's like a line, but I think it's your intention and how you look at what you're making that makes it out there more, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there really has to be a line. Yeah. Um, well, I was just thinking because I wrote about this in my thesis, but um, yeah, Julie Bright Wilson, who wrote the book Prey, says that it's intention, which is the difference between craft and art. Mm -hmm. Like, um, a craft is something that you're, it's essentially something that you're good at. Like, it's, you don't have a thought process to it. It's like buying a sewing pattern and then making it exactly as it is, where I guess Art for me is, what are you saying? Like, what are you trying to say with that? Whereas I guess with craft, you're just trying to feel something. Mm. Or maybe with art, you're, there's a message behind it. Mm. So a technical skill as against um, an intention and meaning. Yeah, mm. but I, I do think there is a line and I like to blur it. Yeah, well, I think that I mean, look at look at what you're doing with your stitching. You're kind of like you're taking that line, uh -huh. and it's sort of as Monica will call it sloppy. And I know in my own practice, I feel like I'm an unskilled crafts person, but I'm making art some, somehow. But the attention is there, but it's not relying on high level skill. Mm. It's just doing, it's just a way of doing something. classmates was trying to conclude, I guess, the debate about um, craft and art in her um, paper, but like we only had so many words, I think we had to do 10,000 at the most, and you have to sort of cut down what you're talking about to be what really is relevant, and like I think one of her, um, um, one of her, one of the um, professors, teachers that was um, like, um, Word, but like monitoring her paper and her art was like um, saying like that debate is kind of doesn't not relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it kind of still is because it comes up all the time. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess it depends. Like well, in that context, maybe in an art school, maybe the debate isn't relevant. But maybe not. Maybe you but can bring it out into the world. And yeah. Like it feels like it's still relevant because it comes up a lot, mm. but I don't know. I guess it just depends how you. Um, I mean, I feel like a lot of the time I don't really know what I'm doing, and I'm definitely not skilled enough because I know there's um there's this um gallery which I think belongs to the Warriors Guild and they sometimes have like they have exhibitions where they 
put like their, um, I think their yearly show from the embroidery so they're doing all the classes and um, all the people who are part of the guild and then they um, also sometimes have quilts there and I found out I followed them on Instagram because I saw the quilts and like I see theirs and I'm like wow that's really skilled that's really beautiful and artistic but I'm like when I look at mine I'm like yes I like no comparing but I just feel like they're very different and I don't think I've done very similar there because there's like highly polished and mine is like my sort of I guess um self-taught um attempts at cooking and I guess it just I guess maybe there is a line, but I guess it's like, I don't know if it really matters to me whether there's a line or not. I guess it sort of just depends, like the intention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I think it's interesting because it's like, the yeah. mm -hmm. like the I mean, um, I find it better on who you're talking to as well, because I mm, have had true. I've had teachers who are like, yes, you do contemporary craft, that's where mm. your practice is, and then I've had other teachers who are like, do not call your practice craft. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> they're like offended that I would say that, you know, yeah. and I, I'm not offended by it. Like I, I love that. Yeah, I love so, and I think the messiness of mm. it. Um, is maybe kind of where the art falls into place. Yeah. Where it's, you know, it's like, it's art, but not with a capital A. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's sloppy and it's messy, but those are where you find feelings and emotions and like how each different stitch of every person is so different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. And I think I went to an exhibition at that time and I was like, oh, those crafts, people are the most of them, yeah. people are all women, yeah. you know, with their intentions, they're probably just as imbued with me, but because mm. it's not presented in that mm. art school context. Yeah, they can yeah. get like hidden in like that. And sometimes it's very technical. Some of it, yeah. how they choose to yeah. describe and approach their work is very technical. Yeah. And then sometimes it's all about, this is where the cloth came from, this is what I felt mm. when I was piecing it. Yeah. So, um, Let's talk about um, textiles and textile processes in terms mm. of drawing. How do you see um, what you're doing as you stitch with needles and thread, or as you cut up with scissors, or um, otherwise colour your textiles? How do you relate that to drawing? Mm, that's a good question. There's so many shapes going through, <laughs> so many colours, there's geometry, there's flowers, there's Oh, well, I think drawing comes into it for me first when I'm actually doing the stitching. Um, I think when I was in uni, um, I was a bit worried because when we had to exhibit, someone mentioned, I think, about having to have all the work signed before it goes up, and I'm like, but I don't sign any of my fabric works because that would just, I don't know, I feel like it would take it away from it as a work. And, like bring your focus back to it, like, as, like, I guess as an artwork and not something that you could play with. And um, I remember one of my teachers saying, like, yeah, but your thread is, like, the signature, because that's your, um, instead of being traditional and, like, signing it with numbers and all that, your thread makes a mark through it and joins all the pieces, and that's, like, your signature. and that's how you draw it all together. I like that. Like the way that you stitch is like it's quite obviously ray, and so then that's the signature. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like that's what brings out the drawing for me first. Mm. Because when like I put it all together, like 
I first have to do, like with the pharynx, I first have to sort of have an idea of what it's going to look like in my mind because I need to print all the pieces and see how they fit together. I mean, it doesn't always work out because sometimes the printing doesn't quite, um, like, I don't register or anything because I hate doing that. I'm a bit, like, lazy in that regard, so it sort of is a bit messy and all over the place and that's like the print sort of participating in the making mm. and then as I cut out the pieces like I usually do that before like I don't measure things like you're supposed to um so the print's definitely an element yeah um and then you're sort of you're composing yeah with the pieces and and I feel like the thread brings it all together. Mm. What about you, Abby? Um, yeah, I think a lot of it, when I think of like, because I do draw as well, mm. and I think drawing and stitching things and quilting things, there's like a messiness to it mm. that like painting doesn't have. Mm. Um, there's like a, an unfinished, quality for me for my work that nothing is ever really quite finished tied with a bow wrapped up and I think that's how drawing kind of works as well and so it's a really it's a way that I can just make without over analyzing and overthinking composition and and that comes later I suppose but it's more like I'm a mathematician trying to figure out how things go together and I think Sometimes with drawing, it can be quite similar, and um, you can kind of do it in a lot of places as well. You know, you can bring a little bit of fabric and a needle with you, or just like how you can bring a sketchbook and a pencil with you wherever you go. And mm -hmm. there's something, yeah, really freeing to me about it that, um, yeah, the like painting, for example, just doesn't have. Yeah, it's more open-ended. It's more open-ended, and there's this. You know, I can stitch a line, and then if it doesn't work, I can rip it up and then stitch another line. And, um, yeah, if you're doing, like, printmaking, you can't really do that. Like, once it's on there, it's on there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's true, but you can always overprint it okay. as well. I don't print and, like, it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can, like, I've done this, like, some of my old prints because I don't really have the space, but I wanted to use them again. I've cut them up and changed them into different Oh, things. yeah. So they're, like, you can collage with them. Mm. So that's definitely something you're both doing. With Abby cutting up her paintings. Yeah. And if you're cutting up prints that you may not want to use in the form that they are to turn them into scraps mm. that then become elements of new things. That yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, sewing is so much, it, it is a collage. And they already degree. come with your marks. Yeah. So the thing about drawing is that it's the marks. And so you've got this sort of preloaded kind of journey where you print mm. and then you're putting it into something else and the object that results almost has this layer of meaning in mm. it as well. That's true. Yeah. I remember when I was trying to figure out like what to call my practice and I was like reading books on like am I a collage artist, am I a quilter, am I a painter, am I <laughs> like what do I do? I still don't have a name for it. Um you know, and they're like, Oh, it's assemblage and I'm like, Well what's the difference between assemblage and collage? And it's all like the same you know, thing. it's just I guess the materials that you're using. And so yeah, and I guess, yeah, when you think about like collaging, that is a form of drawing. Because that's how many people do their sketches. And mm, that's true. So I guess textiles and quilting, it just kind of falls right into it. And the way, yeah, like what Ray was saying about how your stitch is your signature. Like, every artist in here has a very particular way that they stitch. And it's so different than everybody else. Mm. Which is really interesting. Mm. Yeah, I think Alice, who is up collaborators doing mm -hmm. sewing before she was saying um like um uh she wanted to try and do um her stitch not so like embroidery yield sort of way and mm -hmm. i'm like well that's okay you can do that but she's like but for myself i want to do that like break away from that and i feel like after you do something for a while that sort of like a certain way of drawing or a certain way of stitching or 
painting or printmaking or what have you, mm -hmm. that sort of just naturally without thinking you keep doing it that same way after a while mm -hmm. and just even if just little if you go against it like consciously go against it like little bits of it will pop up again and just appear and you're like yes that's still there it's still there still there which is kind of nice in a way it's like trying to change your handwriting yeah yeah um, and that's um one char characteristic of Mm. Yeah. So like, oh, here's my here's my great signature to my great work, and it might be an amazing work, and um, just the process of the project, just sitting mm. there, being a beautifully made, felt, put together, contained thing, and the maker has vanished, <laughs> but hasn't really. You know, yeah. The, um, there's there's something quite interesting about that. In, should I sign my works? And, you know, what even are my stitches? I mean, if you look around this exhibition, you definitely we could we could do a little identification of everybody's stitches. <laughs> yeah. Quite um, characteristic. Yeah. You know, there's Jen sort of doing very soft colours so that you, yeah. you have to really struggle to read it because mm. the work's really about those shadows. Mm. Mitch loves the hum of this sewing machine. Apparently, it's very comforting. So I'm just sort of kind of feeling for this sort of industry. I love the sewing machine, but I work with an artist who cannot stand it. So she stitches everything by hand, and I'm like, but it takes so long. <laughs> and she's like, what do you mean you love it? I was like, I love. Like I don't know. I feel yeah. so comforted by it. And I, yeah, and I like hand sewing as well. There's something really meditative to it. But I think I don't know. I don't know. I prefer hand sewing. I feel like um, it allows me to like focus on what I'm doing a bit more. I don't. I don't mind the machi sewing machine, but like if I'm altering my clothes, I'll use the sewing machine just so I get it done fast. Yeah. But if I make my art, I like to do, take my time with it. Mm. So by hand instead. No, I don't get time with my sewing machine. That too. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a very sensitive pedal. It's like you touch it, and it's like <laughs> you're off, and I'm like. If you make a mistake, then I have to unpick everything, and I hate unpicking. Mm -hmm. I think I've always had like sewing machines from like the 70s and the 60s uh -huh. that once belonged to someone else, and it's something similar to me for textiles. I just like have this fascination that someone else like created a whole life with it, and then I get to do that. Mm -hmm. And nice. so I feel like the sewing machine is not just like a tool. It's like it's a part of the process. It's mm. a collaborator to it again. Mm. And it's part of this weird composition. It's yeah. not bringing anything new, it's bringing things that have a history. And there's like corks and sometimes like, That's you true. know, the threads are loose or it's, you know, it's not working right, but it's like, I know how to use it, but like, I wouldn't let anyone else use it, you know? And it's, I don't know, I've tried to use like the more like modern ones and I'm just, it's those I don't, appreciate as much but mm. I guess yeah. So um mm -hmm. do you have used this this sort of form hallway as part of your process of having a collaborative uh is it always been a quilt or some sort of stitching? Uh for collaboration it's always been a quilt. I feel mm. like um going back to traditional quilting bees, that's how they were always done in the mm. process. I feel like it allows you to talk about it because it's a big, flat, casting fabric mm -hmm. project. And it's like, I'm hoping to bring people together and like create community through it. So, like today we're all here in person. Yeah. They tend to be. Yeah, I tend to be. Plus, I did want to um, include um, an online part where I like, I film it, like I, where I have like a Zoom call, but I've tried that twice before and I do not understand it, so that kind of fails, but it's something for them to incorporate, so people who can't come in person can like work on uh, like a little quilt and a um, little quilt on square and send that in and, and then incorporate it. Yeah. 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 yeah, I want to do something like that. Actually, um, I did take part in recently in 
I think it was, what is it, it's um, uh, part of a, a, a quilt project where you make a quilt to a specific size, I actually forgot the paper, it was like micro paper before I sent it, which kind of made me sad, but um, I think it's the um, Euphoria quilt project, um, and I sent in a piece, and so that will be put together at some point, it's um, a quilt project that's happening in America. Okay, yeah. This is when we forgot to take photographs of the yeah. quilt. Yeah. Well, they're going to send, um, they're going to professionally photograph all the quilt pieces they've got. They've got like more than 100. Yeah. So eventually I will get a professional photo of them. I just yeah. kind of wanted to post about it so I could share about the project. Because mm. it's a really beautiful project um, about gender equality. Mm. Mm. So. Well, well, that's another thing that recurs often in textile art studies. And Monica talks about this mm. quite a bit is this idea of care. Yeah. Mm. And you touch on the comfort and the softness that it, that it, it brings at times. It's another, it's something that comes out of a, a tradition of um, you know, you're caring for the textiles. You, about how it is a safe because I want to like not just make community community but make a safe space within my community making mm. and I like how the fabric is soft and caring and how you have to plaster it so I'm, just, I'm hoping to bring that to people who come to the workshops as well mm. and just care. I think especially when you're working with um, you know, fabrics that once belonged to someone else, mm -hmm. that you're you're holding on to those memories that they had in that, whether you knew them or not. That's how I feel, and like there has there's a care for that. That you know you're taking something that would otherwise just be thrown away, and you're making it into something, and so you're almost like saying like yes. Like you existed. Mm. And just even like the time that you're spending with it. And especially if you're hand sewing and you're just, you know, you're really sitting there and you're thinking and you're touching it. Um, there's just such a level of care there that doesn't ex exist in other places. Mm, it's difficult to think of. Mm -hmm. mm. Who's traditionally attached to ideas about care and comfort in, um, in that way, rather than being a simply a visual expression mm. so embodied. Mm. I think when you're working with like the like tough topics, you know that you're emotionally involved in, mm. you know. Like I know, like for me, I work a lot with like familial memories, and so they're my memories, but they're also not just mine. Mm -hmm. And so I have to really think about: can I tell this person's story, mm -hmm. and how do I tell it in a way that is mm -hmm. not outing them or not offensive, or mm -hmm. and how can I tell it in a way that makes me feel closer to it mm -hmm. as well? Um, and I think. When you're doing that with textiles, it it's a way to yeah be able to tell a story without using language or you know photography or video that mm -hmm. uh, someone else can connect to without ever having to know your story, which is what I really enjoy about it. Mm -hmm. um, Like um, storytelling. 
Yeah. And I think, yeah, I guess it, it's not literal, but it allows people to remember things that maybe they didn't think were that important. Mm. You know, like, and I think that's what textiles do when you're telling stories through them. It, um, it's allowing you to have those, like, everyday memories that, like, aren't the ones that you would tell a new friend about, you know, but the ones that, like, you keep to yourself that because you don't really think that they're anything of you know sitting at the table with your family or, yeah. or meeting someone I new mean, a pair of pajamas or exactly you know, pajamas. Mm -hmm. oh i love pink flannel pajamas or yeah or like you know um like the textiles with the flowers and stuff and having like a memory of like being in the fields like just by yourself like the first time you were by yourself as a kid like in nature and, like these things that you forget about but then I think the nice thing about like patterns and the way that they can be put together is that they can bring you back to something that you didn't even remember mm. like because it wasn't mm, that's true. something that you thought was special or unique. So much about textiles evoke something like what, what you all seem to be doing in this show is there's, there's a shared History or community history, mm -hmm. or, you know, things that are recognised in each work that from my own life or everyday life, mm -hmm. but then they're also so personal as you make them. Yeah. But then it allows you to have these like personal moments yeah. as well, you know? You know? Having a little sister because, <laughs> because of your shared sort of pillows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, all of these fabrics, um, like patterns, sort of show up in other things, like something from a dress that someone might have worn, like you said. Mm. Like, not so much a shared cultural history, but I mean, I guess everyone has a past and different patterns or textures come into that. And like, whenever you're looking at some kind of artwork without I think Monica was saying, like, um, without, it's nice to not always explain everything because, like, sometimes you can read yeah. something that you weren't expecting yeah. or that you were thinking about, but it never really occurred to you until they said it as well. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of nice that there's that, that people can see that in your work as well. Like, they could see the, like, the personal in it? Yeah. Yeah without having to ever say what that is. And yeah. I think that's what I enjoy about it. Like, you know, because it's, I think, you know, kind of like how there's a line, you know, of um, between like craft and art, there's a line of like, um, telling too much and like, mm -hmm. you know, it, in what you're telling, it could be like triggering to somebody or off-putting. Mm -hmm. um, but when you can, have this personal work that you put so much into, there's a relationship that you get out of with the work that then the audience feels, but it's not necessarily like they know your story, mm -hmm. but they just can feel that feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess the feeling is what comes through. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. I feel quite lucky to look closely at your work and be able to, to write and think about it. And I stumbled upon that old Arabic poem. You can have the clock being the mandal of a lover that was used to dry tears and then given to a lover. But then, then it was used to wipe the wine from the original lover's lips, I think. And it kind of, for me, I felt it was like so much about a clock that is humble and mm -hmm. every day yeah. in use and is then transformed in some way, like it's given, like you're using a recycled cloth or textiles, and it's, it's 
40 clock as well. The mm. first person voice is the actual clock talking mm. um, in human. So, yeah, that's a big element of the super thing. <laughs> I'll use that for this, this exhibition. I am the youngest, so I always got a lot of hand me downs. <laughs> but I remember, like, I always kind of quite liked it. I went through a phase where I hated it, and then I really liked it because I, you know, like, my sisters, they, you know, like, have their first kiss in a shirt, and I'd be like, ooh, maybe that will give me <laughs> good luck. I never did. Um, but, you know, I don't know, there was something like, there was, yeah, a life in it, and I thought, well, maybe there's, like, that energy that keeps passing and I think um, yeah it's not for me like just the fact that the textiles aren't going to get thrown away it's also that like it has to have had a life for me to want to use it mm -hmm. yeah like um, I'm still I got a lot of hand-me-downs when I was younger not so much from my older sister but from my cousins because my mm -hmm. mum was the youngest of her siblings to have like the last to have kids and so I got lots of hand-me-downs from my cousins. I really liked it because it was always fun to see the different outfits that they used to have, used to wear and like combine them in different ways. Mm. And, um, so it's always nice to use fabric that's had a life before. Like this bit used to be a shirt that my mum was in. This little snippet. Oh yeah. I zoom fine with this work a little bit with the sleeves, but and I think yeah now like I recently got a bunch of like vintage clothes from my grandmother that passed away, but it's like it's now those are the most like coveted things, mm -hmm. right? To be able to get like your mom's old pants if she saved them, or mm -hmm. your grandmother's like dress. Um, because they're in such impeccable condition and but it's also like that that feeling I guess that you get when you wear it that's so different than when you buy something like new at a store <laughs> you can like feel their yeah their energy and what they kind of did and lived in it and even just the different eras of it mm. but I also don't think that like well, oftentimes with textiles, I'm gravitated to the ones that remind me of someone else. Like, I don't need to know who had it. Mm. Like, that's not, I don't need it to be one of my family members, mm. but I just need it to speak to me, I guess. Mm. Yeah. 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 And in the same way, as you carry that past, you're also very conscious that you're human it now, so there's that, you're not doing the same thing. Mm. No. Yeah. 